Well, I hope you enjoyed this image. Um, did anybody figure out what it is exactly? It's a leopard seal with a penguin in its mouth. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hey, it's the circle of life, right? All right. And I'm hoping that you had time uh, to answer these very quick questions. Um, what do you think an ecosystem is? We're going to be talking a lot about that and different kinds of ecosystems. But there's a, like I said before on that other assignment that we started yesterday, um, there's a lot of vocabulary that you may have covered in other classes, actually, believe it or not. Someone told me that they're taking AP Environmental and they're like covering the same thing. And I'm like, well, everything I can promise, however, everything that we cover is going to be specifically related to the marine environment. OK. So now that you know what these creatures are, you could probably update your answer to question two. How does this picture show the passing of energy in an ecosystem? And that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about, uh, particularly later on in these notes and the next set of notes, uh, which we're going to be doing next week. Okay. All right. So the first part wants us to describe the meaning of parasitism, commensalism, mutualism, and understand they are all examples of symbiotic relationships. Now, if you took biology, you already learned about this, I do believe. Um, you may have even touched upon it and remember it from middle school, but we're going to relate it now and apply it to these concepts, to marine science, okay? So we know that symbiosis is a relationship, a close relationship of two organisms um, that are living, you know, very either so close to each other that they're on, one's on the other, or right next to, okay? And so there's examples from all over the, and all different kinds all over the world. Um, there are bird parasites, there are plant parasites, and then there are these types of parasites, okay? Or symbiotic relationships. I was specifying one, but generally speaking, symbi symbiosis. You have a symbiotic relationship with you. You have a bacteria that live in your gut and on your skin um, and in your mouth and your nasal passages under your fingernails and no you can't scrub them all away nor do you want to um, we can talk about that some other time um, you have mites that live in your eyelashes and other places no you can't scrub them all away um, so parasitism is where one species benefits and the other species is harmed. So an example would be this um, worm living in the muscle tissue of a fish. That's never good. If you have something that's living in your muscle tissue or your intestines typically, um, other than the bacteria that help us break our food down, we're talking about marine organisms here, like worms, I'm talking about worms in this case, it's typically bad, always, okay? Commensalism is when one species is benefited and the other species is neither harmed nor benefited. It's just kind of neutral for that other species, unaffected. And so that would be the barnacles on a whale, okay? Now, I guess sometimes if the barnacles can grow maybe too close to the blowhole or to, um, and this is a gray whale, or uh, to the eye, or even maybe the mouth, they might become a problem, but whales are smart enough to know how to scrape them off on the bottom. Uh, there's videos of that on YouTube. You can see whales doing that. Um, and then mutualism is when they both benefit. So here you have a cleaner shrimp and a fish that is would normally eat that shrimp. But in particular areas, areas on the reef, the fish will line up and it's really quite amazing. And the shrimp and other little fish will come in and they'll go in the mouth and gills and sharks too. And they'll clean all the parasites and, and dead pieces of fish or whatever and things like that off of the bigger fish. And the fish just lets it do it because it knows instinctively 
that it's being benefited. And if it were to eat that shrimp, then it would lose that benefit. It's rather uh, quite miraculous, I think, that those relationships occur. And it occurs on all different levels, uh, you know, different ecosystems. Um, on the grasslands of Africa with the ox picker birds or um, the birds that go into the mouths of alligators and alligators let them clean them. And it's really, really cool. So we're going to talk specifically about a few of these symbiotic relationships now. The first one being the parasitic relationship between uh, copepods, which are a type of marine invertebrate, and marine fish, which are vertebrates, obviously, they have bones, right? Okay, an invertebrate doesn't have bones. Now, some of them can be ectoparasites. These copepods are living on the outside of this, this fish, and others um, can be endo. Well, we'll talk about the endo ones on the next slide. So these, so certain different species of fish can be infe uh, infested, I guess you could say infected with, but that's more like a disease, um, with these parasitic copepods. And the fish will become lethargic, that means not a lot of energy, because the, these are essentially sucking their blood and eating them, weakening their bodies. And then they rub against the substrate. Substrate is the bottom of whatever water they're living in to try to rub off these parasitic clinging on copepods. And some of the damage that can occur are frayed fins because of the, the detriment or the negative effects of these creatures uh, on their bodies, on their tissue. Gill hyperplasia, that's essentially swelling of the tissue. Not quite to the point of a tumor, but still uh, from constantly being damaged from the, and the gills. Gills are very sensitive. I don't know if you've ever gone fishing before, that's one of the first things that bleeds if you damage a fish. Um, or patchy epidermal damage to, and necrosis. So necrosis is dead tissue, necrotic. And then secondary infections, infections can occur as well. Uh, also damage to the eyes or blindness. If one of these things gets on their eye, this is just sand on the outside here, but these are the ectoparasites. So are these different species? You can see they're very different, very different species clinging to these fish, all right? <clears throat> And then here's an endoparasite. So we're gonna watch a little video about this. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you about this yet, so we'll watch the video first. The video tells, talks a lot more about these very creepy creatures, okay? to introduce you to one of the grossest creatures on earth. It's the tongue-eating isopod, Cymothoa exigua. Isopods are crustaceans like lobsters and crabs. This particular isopod happens to live in the ocean and is a parasite. It's a sort of marine louse, uh, only it's way creepier. Hey. Anyway, the first crazy thing to know about these guys is that they're what's called protoandritic hermaphrodites. That means that when they're adults, the males can become females. These isopods infest fish, so what happens is that a number of juveniles enter through the fish's gills and all mature into males. Then, one of the isopods will become a female, and that's when things get really freaky. The female will crawl into the fish's mouth and attach herself to the base of the fish's tongue using her back legs. Then, she'll suck blood from the tongue until it withers and dies. This procedure is quite unpleasant for the fish, but it doesn't kill it. In fact, it starts using the parasite like a prosthetic tongue. Meanwhile, the isopod just continues to hang out in the fish's mouth, Yum. sucking its blood or feeding on fish mucus. mucus. We don't know a ton about the parasite's life cycle, but based on other mouth-infesting isopods, and yes, there are others, the female may even mate while in the fish's mouth, with male isopods living in the fish's gill chamber. 
I know this doesn't sound real, so here's a photograph of a mouth infesting isopod to prove it. Thankfully, these guys don't infest humans, but they do infest fish that we eat. Cymothoa exigua has a preference for snapper, and other mouth infesting isopods prey upon mahi mahi or barramundi. So the next time you're at the grocery store, take a look inside that red snapper's mouth. You might find a tasty treat inside. Ew. Okay, so like I said before, these are endo, meaning inside parasites. And these are real pictures of different creatures that have had succumbed to this parasitic infection. Okay. <clears throat> so we have this, now that's parasitic. This is commensalism. So remember what commensalism is. Commensalism is when two species interact um, and help each other. Like what you guys are supposed to do with your partners at your tables. You're supposed to help each other, not be so selfish with everything. Um, but you're not a different species. So manta rays, we have them in the Atlantic Ocean. We have them uh, here out just right off the Gulf. They'll sometimes come really close to the shore. And they are typically found, as well sharks as well, with these fish attached to them. Now manta rays are cartilaginous. They don't have any bones. We're gonna learn about those in the future. Remora are uh, bony fish. So um, just some extra information there. So the remora benefits because it gets a free ride on the manta. It's like uh, sitting on the wing of an airplane. Um, protection, because they're relatively small and if you hang out with somebody big, they're gonna protect you, right? And scraps of food that may get left over from the uh, manta ray finding its own food, okay? Manta rays are really kind of filter feeders, but if the remora are hanging out around um, sharks, definitely there's gonna be lots of scraps of food. I'll show you a picture of that next. And of course the manta ray is unaffected. Um, right, I think I described mutualism before, um, where, they, where they both benefit. Um, this one is, one is benefited, the other is not benefited or harmed, it's just unaffected. Right, that's commensalism, sorry. And then, um, and, but this special type of commensalism between these two, and this is one of those words I believe that you defined in your assignment uh, yesterday, was phoresis. That's how you pronounce it, phoresis. So here's um, the close-up of the remora's suction cup. Okay, and there's a question about this in your notes. Your notes are filled with all kinds of questions and extra things you have to put in, so just be aware of that while you're going down. Um, it's um, a modified dorsal fin. So how many fish have an actual fin, you know, back here on their back, um, evolution has developed that fin into uh, kind of like a sucker, which it can grasp on and hold on while the larger organism is swimming so they can hold on, okay? And they always try to hitch rides. And this is what they look like. Uh, there's different species. Um, this is the same species as that. But this one's a little bit different, as you can see. And it's definitely a suction cup, okay? And then pilot fish is another example. So here you have a whale shark with um, remora definitely swimming around. These are the striped remora, but there's also a pilot fish here. So, um, and for the same reason that they have the commensalistic relationship with manta as they do with the whale sharks. And then these are pilot fish and they follow sharks because other animals might eat them, but they won't come near the shark, right? Like so we said before. And in return, the sharks don't eat the pilot fish because the pirate pilot fish eat parasites off of the shark, like we mentioned with the um, cleaner shrimp before, okay? So these types of relationships are happening all the time out there. And then the last one we're going to talk about is the pom-pom crab or the boxer crab, okay? Um, and anemones. So this is, this is not part of the crab, these things that the crab is waving back and forth. 
These are actually anemones, which are invertebrates that have stinging cells. They're related more to, um, I guess, corals and jellyfish and those types of, of, of organisms, with organisms with uh, stinging cells. They're called cnidarians, but we'll get to that later. They're animals, they're not plants. And uh, through its development, through its growth and development to maturity, these boxer crabs will pick up two boxing gloves, sea anemones. And they will use them as protection against something that's going to come and attack it, um, which is quite amazing. Okay, so, so now the anemone also gets protection from uh, being eaten because of the crab, right? It's, it's uh, keeping it keeping a fish from eating the anemone, moving around, taking it. Otherwise, the anemone would be stuck in one spot. So the anemone gets to travel around as well. So it receives food, scraps, leftovers. Okay, so now we're moving on to the next topic, which is um, relationships in feeding among consumers, producers, omnivores, carnivores, herbivores, decomposers, the predator-prey relationship, food chain, food webs, and trophic levels. Whew, that's a lot of words. That's a lot of vocab. So I broke them up into each has having its own slide and with examples. So in your notes, you'll see that there's room for you to include the examples that I talk about, the marine examples, in each of, on each of these slides, okay? Okay, so we're going to talk about consumers first. Consumer, well, we're consumers, so we kind of know what that means. So, something that consumes something uses it for, typically, for energy, okay? And we, in this case, we're talking about consuming uh, food, right? So when one or, uh, organism eats another organism, so here you have, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, you have in the, um, the mammal, the marine mammal with the thickest coat of fur in all the world is the sea otter. And obviously he's eating a crab. And then you have this uh, invertebrate, this um, echinodermata. This is a sea star. We don't say starfish because they're not fish. That's an old term, we say sea stars. Um, and they use their tube feet. When they get enough tube feet on a clam, I don't know if you ever try to open up a clam or a mussel, but you can't do it with your bare hands. Nobody can, you have to have a tool. Um, their tool is these tube feet that grab on and just inch the clam open a little bit and then they eviscerate, in other words, throw up their stomach into the clam through the tiny space that they open up and then they, they digest the clam from inside the clam shells. That's pretty wild. So definitely a consumer, an organism that eats another organism. Producers, on the other hand, don't eat anything. They make the food. They produce the food. And there's two types. There's the photosynthetic producer, and then there's the chemosynthetic producer, the ones that live down deep in the hydrothermal vent uh, environment. Okay, so we'll talk about the, the um, photic zone first, okay? So they are using a non-living environmental factor, meaning the sun in this case this is a kelp forest they occur in different parts of the world but particularly uh, as far as we're concerned in america they grow in um, the pacific northwest okay off the coast of california and washington and oregon and um, they make sugar they make glucose right if you took biology you learn this um, if not you're learning it now um, and and that glucose is used for the rest of the food chain going down the line all the way to to us i guess when you eat a fish you are getting energy that was made originally by plants or algae they're not quite plants um these this is algae a very big algae very long algae growing very fast but it's algae and then um, so that was a photosynthetic example. This is a chemosynthetic example. Remember the hydrothermal vents, okay? These are muscles living at the hydrothermal vent, and inside the muscle, 
are these chemosynthetic bacteria that virtually do the same thing that the plants do or the photosynthetic producers do, except instead of using um, sunlight, they're using hydrogen sulfide that's coming out of here as their energy source. And then they combine it with carbon dioxide and water, just like a plant does, and they, and they end up with the, the same product, sugar, glucose, and, um, well, in, in our case, in plants' case, it would be oxygen, but down here, they're producing other compounds because they, they have to do something with that sulfur. So this is uh, hydrogen sulf uh, sulfate, actually. Herbivores. Here's our famous manatee um, that uh, we're familiar with. If you've been, actually, that might be a dugong, which is a relative of the manatee. And they love both, both, both organisms. They're similar, fam, you know, same family. They love to eat uh, sea grasses. Okay, so they're like, that's why they call them sea cows, because they graze along the bottom, just like, and they're gentle and, you know, but big, um, just like land cows, all right? And these are sea urchins that are eating kelp in a kelp forest. And you can see that they've eaten a lot and they've grown a lot. So um, the, these guys consume producers. They are consumers, but they're not carnivores. They're herbivores, right? Eat like a vegans, I guess, of the animal world. And then here's the carnivores and they consume animals. Obviously, um, here's your barracuda. I saw some of these snorkeling last weekend. They're about this big. I was chasing them. They weren't big enough to hurt you. So, um, and then um, seagulls, obviously, eating a clam. Carnivore, eating meat. But seagulls are, seagulls hunt, but they're also scavengers too. They'll eat, you know, dead stuff. And then we've got omnivores. Omnivores are, eat, we're omnivores. They eat both producers, which are plants and, you know, and animals. So here you've got a sea turtle. Sea turtles eat both animals. He's eating a jellyfish. You could see how a plastic bag floating in the water could look like a jellyfish to a sea turtle, and that's why sea, um, you know, sea turtle populations are, you know, not doing too well because of all the plastic waste. But they love jellyfish, and the stinging tentacles don't bother them. It's pretty amazing. And then of course they're eating uh, the grass, the sea grass, the same. Uh, food that uh, manatees eat. So they're omnivores. They, they eat both animals and plants. And then you have decomposers. Decomposers are typically bacteria for the most part, but you also have some worms and um, here's a bristle worm, a zombie worm, some shrimp, okay? Um, hooded shrimp, they're called. And here is a whale carcass at the bottom of the ocean. A dead whale sinks to the sea, sea floor and then You've got these cookie cutter sharks and, and this, these other scavengers that come in. And these are hagfish and they come in and they just rip it apart. You got crabs, okay? And then um, once the, the main part is, you know, eaten away, then the other parts are broken down as well by these opportunists. And these are your decomposers. These are the things that are returning as well as, so you've got mussels, two worms, clams, um, limpets, which are little single shelled organisms that like suck on to something, okay? You can see them if you go to blowing rocks uh, in, uh, in Jupiter, you know, just north of Jupiter Beach. We talked about, talked about that before. And then you've got bacteria converting everything, not just the meat and, you know, the, the organs, but the bones now. Now they're inside the bones and they're converting um, the, the bacteria are converting it to new substances that start the whole cycle over again. Just like if you put a, you know, a sandwich outside on the grass and then you came back you know, five days later, there'd be no sandwich there, right? Because all the animals would come in, they'd eat it, and they'd break it down in, in, into nothing. It would be recycled back into the environment again, which is returning the nutrients to the food chain. Um, there are videos of these whale carcasses down in the ocean. Um, I think they did a study actually too, because it's you know, obviously very hard to find a random whale carcass at the bottom of the sea. So they found one washed up on the shore once, 
at least once. They may have done it more than once. And they purposely sunk it where they knew it was going to be. And then they videoed it and they watched it and they, they um, just recorded it and they discovered new organisms and, and a whole new process of, of recycling nutrients back into the environment. It's really kind of cool. And then we've got the predators, which obviously are carnivores, but um, particularly hunting other animals. So the, to be a predator is one animal hunting another and, and eating another animal, okay? So I found some pretty interesting pictures here. Not all of them relate to Florida. I just thought this one was cool because of the, um, it's like a narwhal being eaten by a polar bear. How did that even happen? But anyway, polar bear's happy. Um, narwhal's not happy. But do you know that narwhal, this is not a horn? It's always depicted as a horn in cartoons and everywhere, commercials. It's actually a tooth. It's a tooth that, uh, it's a tusk, really, okay? So don't be one of those people fooled thinking it's a horn, okay? Like on a rhinoceros or something. Um, here you have great blue heron, very famous bird, biggest uh, heron type bird in Florida, possibly the world, I think. And we've got them all over the place here in Florida. Uh, eating a fish, getting ready to eat a fish, head first, otherwise the spines would get stuck in its throat. So it always has to swallow it head first. And then this creature is called a cone snail, and it's, it's got a toxic barb, a harpoon that comes out of this projection, of this you know thing, and it's, it'll stab a fish and inject it with a toxin, which makes the fish obviously stop moving, and then the snail has its way with the fish, okay? It eats it, consumes it. And this is what the harpoon looks like up close. It's literally like a harpoon, like for like hunting whales back in the day, okay? I wonder if that's where people got the idea from, maybe. I don't know, but it's, it's just incredible to be a naturally formed thing like that. Okay, and obviously the opposite of a predator is a prey organism. And so you've got these fish uh, balls or you know bait balls they're called we watched them when we when we were watching the um, underwater live feed from the Deerfield Beach Pier we watched these guys swimming around these are uh, herring okay and they are prey fish they still they'll eat their own prey teeny tiny things in the water plankton and stuff but they are they Pretty much everywhere, anything <laughs> eaten by something else is prey. So even a shark could be prey, even though it's also a predator. Um, and then I, I chose this one because no one's ever actually seen this before, but we know what happens because, well, we have, this is probably the closest picture we have to a sperm whale having just won a battle with its prey deep, um, like a mile deep in the ocean. That's where they find these giant squid. And we know that they, um, have these battles to the death down there because most sperm whales, adult sperm whales, have sucker scars on their bodies from where the this, this, um, squid is trying to, you know, get out, get, get away. And then uh, whales that were harpooned back in the day or washed up on the shore, when they do a dissection, they find the beaks, the un undigestible beak of the whale uh, sorry, of the um, uh, squid in the whale's stomach. And uh, it's like made out of a very strong, it's made out of kind of what a, a shell of a crab is made out of. So it's, it's hard to, to digest. <clears throat> food chain, now we're moving on to the food chain. So and we're on slide 18, just uh, for reference sake. So um, the, a food chain shows a singular feeding relationship. Um, and the arrows here on this picture, I added those, they represent the energy flow and what eats what. So the energy is going from this level to this level to this level to this level. It's a chain, right? And um, we're going to learn that there's a lot more of these, and then there's less of these, and less of these, and less of those. And the picture kind of depicts that. What I thought was neat about this is that it's uh, from Great Britain, and there, there are stamps that 
are coming out this year or came out this year. You can probably order them from somewhere, I don't know, but these are stamps for postage. And they chose a marine food chain for their, for their stamps. That's, I think that, I just thought that was really cool. That's how important this concept is to understand because of the way humans treat the environment. It's important to know um, all the relationships, okay? And so it's a transfer of energy from an algae to a top predator. And that's really what a food chain is. It's simple. Um, you can make them from virtually any animal that you choose in the sea. It's, it's going to be involved in some kind of food chain. Not virtually, every animal, okay? Here's the, and then if you take multiple food chains and you put them together, you are going to get something called a food web, okay? And here is a very complex one. I chose this one to show you, and this is by far not even close to everything that's involved here. This is just showing a smattering, a sampling of the organisms that can take place in these and how everything is related. So here you've got mangrove swamp, okay, or mangrove. We have um, mangroves all along the intracoastal, right here, Boca Raton and north and south, all the way down to the Keys and all the way up to um, North Florida, okay? Mangroves are in estuaries. Remember that? Mixture of fresh and salt water. And so on one side of them, you're going to get freshwater species, which we're not going to talk about. And on the other side, you're going to get the saltwater species, which we are going to talk about. That's why on your notes, this section is, is, has been um, separated and included, and you have to label parts of it. So there are three parts on here that you have to label. And, but, I, but really, it's to show you how complex, if you take all the food chains, or just some of them, and you superimpose them on top of each other, um, how quite amazing it all is, okay? Invertebrates, vertebrates, um, bony fish, bony mammals, cartilaginous, no bone uh, fish, tiny zooplankton and algae, um, and all of these Arthro uh, uh, amphipods and, and bacteria and seagrass and just all of it's just there, all involved together. So if you pulled one out, you would affect everything else in the chain, which really is connected to other chains. So it's a really complex system that people don't really understand. That's why invasive species are problems and, and um, when you introduce a new species, it just it offsets the whole thing. Like lionfish, for example. Lionfish escaped in a hurricane um, several, many years ago. Not too many years ago, but in the last 20 years or something like that. From down in Miami, uh, a big tank overflowed and all the lionfish escaped and they're eating like everything. So um, that's an invasive species that's affecting the food web here in Florida. And then trophic levels. So you've got some filling out to do here, okay, on your notes. Um, this is the feeding or nourishment level in a food chain or web. So here's the food web, okay, another example of a marine food web with the producers on the bottom making food from the sun, right? And you go up the different levels to the top predator, okay? And so these levels are called primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary, okay? And they're here as well. So these are the trophic levels, and you've got primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary consumers. And this is just an abbreviation for them. So please notate that on your paper, what those are, because you have to fill them in on the blank, but if you don't 
know what you're writing, if you don't know that that means primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary, then perhaps on a future test, you might be rather confused why you don't know the answer, okay? So please notate that as well as filling in this information here that's missing. So anyway, so this is a chain pulled out from the web and then you, an you can analyze it by telling what the um, su su successive levels are in this energy pyramid, okay? And if you, I don't know if you remember from maybe your environmental class or biology that this 10% rule. So if I have a thousand units, this is supposed to be a thousand here, of energy, I'm only going to get 10% of that energy in the next trophic level. And then 10% of that energy is available to the zooplankton in that level. And only 10% for the fish. And 10% of that for a bigger fish. Okay? So that's what um, energy trophic levels are referring to. Okay? All right, here's some more vocabulary. Holy cow. All right. So um, an ecosystem. What is an ecosystem? And we're going to be talking about all of these separate ecosystems uh, in the future, uh, in the next, I believe, in the very next unit. So it's a system of organisms and their non-living um, environment. So everything that's alive and everything that's not alive that occurs in uh, an environment is an ecosystem, okay? So ecology is the study of ecosystems. It's a study of how the living and non-living things interrelate and react to each other and need each other to survive. Well, the non-living things don't need anything, but it's how the living things interact with the non-living things. So let's point out some non-living things here, okay? So what do we have here? What's non-living? Okay, the water, obviously, the air, and the clouds, and maybe some sand down here on the bottom, okay? And that's probably pretty much it. Here we have the water and rocks, because these these are all everything else is alive. And here, what do we what do you see here? The water again, obviously. Those barnacles on this, uh, I believe this is a, a right whale, um, are uh, are alive. So you can't count those. But the sun, dappling on the, the sunlight, is obviously a part of the non-living environment. <clears throat> habitat, what, is a, what does it mean to be a habitat? Habitat is a place where things live. That's it, habitat, okay? This is a uh, saltwater marsh habitat, which I am very fond of, okay? My book that's out um, pretty much talks nothing about nothing else but saltwater marshes and growing up and some adventures that some people had um, out on the salt marsh. All true stories, by the way. Um, this is a sandy shore habitat, which we talked about in the last uh, unit. And this is a coral reef habitat. All very different. And um, with different, different uh, environmental factors, non-living, as well as um, living, different species of organisms. Speaking of species, um, species de is defined as similar organisms that can interbreed and make viable, fertile offspring. If two species come together and they're similar, but the babies they make can't make their own babies, that's what defines, that's the line that's drawn between two different species, okay? You may have heard of a liger, which is like part lion and part tiger, but a lion and a tiger are two different species that are separated far enough where the, they can have a baby called a liger, but the liger can't have babies, it's sterile. Same with a horse and a donkey, you get a mule. Mules are sterile, they can't have babies. Okay, um, so an example of a particular species, and my favorite, dearest to my heart, is the humpback whale. Okay, so your job is to write down the scientific name properly, not all this, 
that's the, uh, just a, um, the taxonomic classification. But this is a scientific name and a proper way to write it. I know some of you are writing it right now, so be careful. You may have to erase what you just wrote or cross it out if you're writing a pen. When you write or when you type a scientific name, it must be italicized. So if you're typing this, that's easy. If you're writing it, you can't italicize because everything's italicized. The rule for writing a scientific name is to underline it. And both ways, typing or writing, the first letter, which is the genus, the first is always capitalized. The second one, I see this mistake all the time in movies and books and magazine articles um, because they're not scientists, right? Is lowercase. This is the proper way to write a scientific name. So if you're talking about humans, Homo sapiens, the H in Homo would be capital, but the S in sapiens would be lowercase and it would be all italicized. If it was handwritten, it would be underlined. So I'm going to be checking for that when I check these notes. Make sure you do it right, okay? And then, of course, the, right, the common name is the humpback whale. Okay, what's a niche? You could say niche, you could say niche. Um, I prefer the term niche, actually, but um, a niche is an uh, acceptable way to say it. You may have learned, about, learned that. So you just have to pick one of these, the flamingo, the duck, the avocet. It's hard to read because it's uh, fuzzy up here, too. Um, an oyster catcher, one of my favorite birds, okay? Or a plover, those little tiny birds that run around the beach, okay? Oyster catchers you might not typically see on the beach. You might see those further, like, more inland, like in the estuary, okay? Um, anyway, pick one of these as your example. And they all occupy a role, a, a particular role in... So these are all in the... Um, the uh, the littoral zone, right, of, the, of a shoreline, but they all, occup they all focus on different areas so that they're not competing with each other. And that's what a niche is. You may have heard of niche as a niche market in business or a, a niche bus you know, business concept, where if you're gonna open up a business somewhere, make sure that you are able to provide what nobody else can provide so there's no competition. And that's what's happening here. There's no competition in those different areas, or little competition. Biodiversity. Biodiversity is the number of living things in an ecosystem or a habitat. So these are the fishes of the southeast Atlantic coast. When you go out in the water, in the ocean, and off of Florida, off of Boca Raton, these are the fish that you would probably be able to find, plus a lot of others, okay? So the more there are, the more different species there are, the more biodiverse uh, a region is, a habitat, an ecosystem is, okay? And of course, a coral reef is known to be one of the most biodiverse uh, ecosystems in the world, as well as like perhaps the Amazon rainforest or um, even estuaries are extremely biodiverse. Okay, population, we're going to go really quick now because we only have a couple minutes left before class is over. Um, a population is a group of the same species living together in the same habitat. So here we have a popul population of brown pelicans. Yes, only the front is focused, the rest is out of focus. Here we have a population of snook, maybe right off the coast here, okay? Uh, the pelicans would be breeding inland. There's quite a few parks around here that have bird breeding, uh, marine bird breeding habitats. Right, right around here, within a few minutes drive, I've been to them. And then a community is you take groups of different populations and you put them in the same habitat. So here you have those snook that I showed you before, but then you pull out and you see the other populations of other fish. So you've got different species of fish over here, going around the poles, and different species of fish in this bait ball. And then if you look closely, you might actually see some other species wandering around somewhere that don't quite fit in with the other ones, okay? So different populations is a community. And then let's see, yeah, that's our last slide. So good, we're almost done. So um, the arrows again represent the energy transfer and something called biomass, which we're going to talk about in the next um, part of this notes. So you have to know how to interpret 
a picture like this, okay? What's eating what? Where is the energy going? Um, you, you would have to be able to trace a food chain, sorry, a food chain in a food web. So I could pick, I could, you know, I pulled this out of this, because you see the uh, orca whale, it's not really a killer whale. People call it that, but it's an orca whale. You don't call a lion a killer cat or a wolf a killer dog or us killer humans because we eat meat, right? So it's an orca whale. Anyway, so you can pull it out and you can make into, you can make multiple different food chains from a food web. And so you just have to know how to draw one, how to pull one out, like trace it up and know how to read one. Okay, and we're gonna have a little bit of practice on that uh, in the future. And then finally, predator and prey populations are interrelated. So this is in your notes. All you have to do is answer a couple of questions about this and never take anything at face value because obviously sharks eat seals, but guess what? Sea lions, this is a sea lion, baby sea lion. Sea lions also eat sharks. So no playing around. It's a dog eat dog world out there. Um, and you have to answer a question about the increasing and decreasing population of one species versus another, okay? So um, the sea lions are the dark black and the great whites are the gray. It doesn't say that, so you just, did you hear what I said? The sea lions are the dark line and the sharks are the light line, okay? All right, so answer that question in your notes, and we are calling it done.